Please be seated. And as you take your seat, you can open with me to the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. We're in a series of messages going through this somewhat unusual book of the Bible, of the Old Testament, that speaks so much of the theme of love. And you remember, we have a dual perspective in this book. There is a perspective that is heavenward as we look at God's love for His children. And then, subsequent to that, we see also the biblical model for love between a husband and a wife, between a man and a woman in the confines of marriage. There are many other things that are wonderful in this book that we will see, and a part of it is its reflection of the gospel message, which I think will become more and more clear as we go through uh, these weeks of study in Song of Solomon. Today I want you to notice two things. There are two movements that are clear in this passage. The first one is what I would call love in the present, or loves already in verses 1 through 7. And then secondly, in verse 8, all the way to the end of the chapter, we would say not love in the present, but love in the future. Or to put it another way, loves not yet. So we have loves already and loves not yet. Those would be the two divisions that we will look at today as we consider a further expression of this man and woman and their love for each other as a symbol and a reflection of God's love for us. Let's ask the Lord to give us grace and mercy as we study together uh, this morning in prayer. Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Father, we wish to see Jesus and Him only. And Father, we pray that You would give us understanding and wisdom way beyond our years as we look into Your infallible, inspired, and inerrant Word. Indeed, Lord, speak to our hearts of eternal things. And we'll give You the praise and glory at the end of it. And we make our prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, I want you to notice love in the present, or loves already. And there are three things I'd like you to notice under this heading. Number one, uh, there are statements of mutual delight in each other. We see this in verses 1 through uh, 3. First, the young woman, or the Shulamite, or I might say the bride, speaks in verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Now, the flowers that are mentioned here are not the modern namesakes. When we think about a lily, uh, when we think about a rose and that sort of thing, they point to something different. The rose of Sharon is probably a crocus, a daffodil, or some other type of flower. The lily refers to a flower of unknown variety. And this is not self-praise. In other words, you should not read this as the young woman, the Shulamite, saying, uh, I'm this one and only lily of the valley. You know, they're really very plain flowers. And what she is saying is, not self-praise, but in a very modest self-appraisal of herself, she is saying that she is only one of many flowers. Only one of many. Out in the field. But once again in verse 2, the groom speaks, or King Solomon and once again, the man's evaluation of her worth is far higher than her own evaluation of it. And he says, compared to her, all other women are thorns. You see the contrast. His love is exclusive and not distracted by any other woman. You know, as believers, we are the object of Christ's un failing love. And we are beautiful in His eyes. 
We'll talk about that a little more uh, coming up. But there is something beautiful here as the king's estimation of the Shulamite woman raises her up. It dignifies her and her beauty and sets her apart. Now in verse 3, she makes an estimation of him. If she is a lily of the valleys, then he is an apple tree. And he offers her shade and food, for she is in constant need of both security and strength. You know, in her younger days, as we studied last week, the Shulamite sweated in the open sun. That's why her skin was so tanned or burned. But now she enjoys the protection and the security of him. In addition to security, he offers sweetness and enjoyment. I can't help but think about the psalmist, so taste and see that the Lord is good. And like the delicious crunch of a juicy apple in the heat of the day, so is her enjoyment of his protective love and care. And so they exchange these statements to each other, and they complement each other. Now let's move on to verses 4 through 6. Things become more intense. We see the groom's passion in verses 4 through 6. He has brought me, and again, the the Shulamite is speaking. He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. A banquet hall is literally a house of wine. That is, meaning a house of love. So the mood becomes more intimate. And she's moving into an experience of intense joy and gladness. A banner is a focusing point and conveys here that the groom does not mind the whole world knowing of his love for her. In other words, there's no shame involved. The groom is outwardly open and very public about his commitment to the bride. I'm constantly reminded of marriage vows. Why do we have marriage vows? Because we're sinners and we're prone to wander. And when a man and a woman come together, that's why we do it publicly with vows to do the very best to tie ourselves at that point to our responsibility that we are engaging in. It's a very solemn thing. And it's tragic what marriage has been made, the marriage relationship as well as the wedding ceremony in our day. It's often nothing but a joke. To see who can spend the most amount of money on the biggest party and not even think about the solemnity of the moment and what you're engaging in. Well, she says, the banner over me is love. There's no shame involved. And you'll notice in verses 5 and 6, the groom's passion for his bride leads the bride to be lovesick. Look at verse 5. Sustain me with raisin cakes. Refresh me with apples because I am lovesick. To be lovesick is to be faint with love. And she both pines for his love and has become faint with happiness, because his love sustains her. And so then there are images of a physical embrace. Once again, the book's unashamed physical frankness is again obvious uh, to the reader. Now the point here is that the groom's passionate reception and acceptance of the bride causes her to be lovesick. To put it another way, she is overcome by the many expressions of love. He wants all the world to know his love for her. And he offers her provisions of every kind to sustain her. And he embraces her to demonstrate overwhelming love for her. I can't help but think of Paul's words. The love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ constraineth us. These are the words of the Shulamite woman, but what she is expressing is her response to the overwhelming love of the groom. We read something about it today. The length and breadth and height and depth of what love really is will be shown later in Christ. But for now, in its infancy stage, we have a description of love. And love for you and love for me from God brings forth love and devotion of our lives toward Him. And so we have here 
uh, mutual delight in each other, the groom's passion. And then in verse 7, we have the bride's patience. It's like all of a sudden somebody drops a bomb in this passage. Look at verse 7. She yells out, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Interestingly enough, this same phrase or sentence is present in the book two more times. Three times it's stated inside of this book. It's a driving theme. And this verse provides one of the most basic principles of true love relationships. It speaks of genuineness, reality, and the right timing. You know, it's a sin that causes physical love to be expressed at the wrong time and place with the wrong person. It's just sin. There is a time and a place for everything in the Lord. The writer of Ecclesiastes makes that clear. And our sinful world arouses and awakens love in false and evil ways. She tells them not to arouse love itself. And the charge that she's giving to herself as well as all the other young women in the court is that you should not allow yourself to be aroused sexually until the proper time and the person arrives for you. Very important. The natural joy of sexual awakening, which the Song of Solomon certainly endorses, can be ruined by premature experimentation. And so she gives a word of caution. And thus she challenges the women by the doe and the gazelle. Why would she say such a thing? Well, the doe and the gazelle were very, very graceful creatures in the ancient world. And for a woman to awaken love before it pleases is to be deprived herself of the full experience of romance and sexuality that God intended for a man and a woman to enjoy exclusively in marriage. And that is symbolized by these graceful creatures. That's what God's plan is. Well, we have now at the end of verse 7 an unexplained absence of the groom. All of a sudden she's talking about his love, his present reception of her, his care for her, but all of a sudden he's gone. It's an unexplained absence of the groom. And that's where verse 8 picks up in the second part of our story here in chapter 2. That is, we've seen love in the present. Now we see love's not yet or the future of love. I want you to notice three things under this. First of all, the groom's return. It's almost as if he's absent and all of a sudden, look at verse 8. Listen, my beloved, behold, he's coming. Climbing on the mountains, leaping on the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. The bride acknowledges the return of the groom. He comes with speed and enthusiasm. He stands behind a wall and looks through the window. He is earnest and excited to come for his bride. Then we see the groom's invitation. The groom has been away, but he's coming back. And then there's this gracious invitation. Look at verses 10 through 14. He comes to the bride to take her to himself. And the season in verses 11 through 13 is significant. He says, winter is past. The rain is over and gone. It's springtime. The deadness of winter gives way to new life of spring. Look at verse 14. Oh, my dove, the clefts of the rock in the secret place of a steep pathway. Let me see your form. Let me hear your voice. The cleft of the rock was a secret place for the bride. And so the groom can see her form and hear her voice. It's a picture of exclusive intimacy. As Moses enjoyed. You remember that story where he said, Lord, show me your glory, show me your glory? In Exodus 32 or 33, I believe. And God said, I will pass by you and I will put you in the cleft of the rock. You can see my backside, but my face will not be seen. It's a place of intimacy. The bride's whole being, body and soul, 
belongs to the groom and vice versa. And they delight in one another. But the groom has been away and he is coming back now. And he arrives and once again declares his love for the bride. Now once again, just like verse 7, we see verse 15. It's like somebody dropped a bomb in this passage. Verse 15 is the groom's warning. Look what he says. Catch the foxes for us. The little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in a blossom. Just like the bride's declaration about patience in verse 7, this verse seems like an unusual and an abrupt interruption. The groom is completely taken by the bride. And he offers this sober word because he doesn't want anything. That is to say, the little foxes to interfere with the blossoming of their love for each other. It's a statement of caution. It's a statement of sobriety. Because the little things add up, don't they? In the marriage relationship. There can be love and it can blossom, and it usually does at the very beginning of a relationship. But as time goes on, the little foxes, the little things that get in the way of love blossoming, and love growing can cause all kinds of problems. Well, I've run through the story here. Now, what can we learn from this second chapter of the Song of Songs? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so hopefully I can take a stab at it. I want you to look at it once again in a dualistic way. I want you to have a heavenly perspective of this passage, and then I want you to have an earthly perspective. Or a view from the top down and then a view from the bottom up, if you will. First of all, the heavenly perspective. This passage foreshadows the entire message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've already noticed it, but this chapter foreshadows that gospel. That's love's already in verses 1 through 7. It's a picture of Christ's love for us. As the groom admires the bride and lifts her self-worth to a whole new level, so also Christ comes to us, He chooses us, He lifts us up from our sinfulness, and He applies His righteousness to us, and He pays the penalty for our sin. The first seven verses of this passage present the groom receiving and securing the bride. And ladies and gentlemen, as the groom receives and secures the bride and furnishes her with every good thing to sustain her forever, so also our Lord Jesus Christ enters our heart, removes our disgrace, and furnishes us with eternal life. Everything else necessary as we wait for His return. That's why we read Matthew 6.33, that portion of the Sermon on the Mount where people are running here and there. He says in the Gentile world, what shall we eat and drink and what shall we put on? And Christ says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. In other words, look at the love of God in Christ Jesus and you'll feel a great sense of peace and contentment when you trust in Him alone because you will be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that's the only righteousness that will stand the judgment of Almighty God. Well, just as the bride waits patiently for the groom's return, that is the full consummation of their union together, so also Christians wait patiently for Christ's return to take us, the bride, His church, to be with Him forever. There's so many parallels as we look at this passage. I think of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. You know, when Christ is gone and when He comes again, winter is passing in Narnia. And spring is coming because the King is on His way and He will not be stopped until He returns for His children. That great love of His, which can hardly be known to the human mind. The length and breadth and height and depth, the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, is being poured out. As the Apostle John states, we love because He first loves us. 
And that rock was cleft for us so that we might find ourselves in the cleft of the rock. At every turn, this passage foreshadows the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me hasten to say, even though this entire book demonstrates the relationship between a man and a woman, that doesn't leave out those who are single. Some of you are widowed or widowers. Some of us may be divorced. Some of us may be single by choice all of our lives. The beauty of the dualism of this book is that we can drink deeply, just as much as anyone else, of the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. Because it's all over the book. And so from a heavenly perspective, this passage foreshadows the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you and I put ourselves in the place of the bride. Are we looking forward to His return? Are we clothed in His righteousness? Do we see ourselves hiding in the cleft of the rock, the Lord Jesus Himself? Are we earnest and desirous of His return, even as the Shulamite woman is in this passage, the return of the King? This passage foreshadows the Gospel of Christ. And it's a challenge to us to ask the hard question, have I received that good news? Have I put my faith and trust in Christ? Is He the one I'm living for, the kingdom of God? Or am I going through life simply saying, what shall I eat and drink and put on? Etc., etc. It's a very important question. Well, from a heavenly perspective, this passage foreshadows the gospel. And from an earthly perspective, this passage reminds us that divine love must condition the proper expression of human love. Let me say that again. Divine love conditions the proper expression of human love. The beauty of this passage is God's determined, relentless love for lowly sinners, as portrayed in the love of the groom for the bride. And I go back to the apparent interruptions in this passage. Verses 7 and verse 15. Verse 7, the beautiful tension between sexual expression and self-control. Young people, when you do go off to college or when you go off to work someplace, don't settle for the lie of this world, which says that Christians are a bunch of prudes. That they don't even want to talk about sex, much less engage in it. That is a lie from hell. There's no shame in sexual enjoyment before the Lord. But the beauty is the tension between sexual expression and self-control. And self-control comes when the Spirit of God is resonant inside a young man or a young woman. Therefore, you have the presence of mind, young ladies, not to give your bodies on the altar of some boy's passions. And young men, you have the presence of mind to respect God's creation in front of you and not take advantage of her to erase that sexual arousal at the wrong time. There's no shame in enjoyment before the Lord. And conversely, Christians are not obsessed with or enslaved to sex. We're seeing the fruit of decades of sexual obsession and enslavement come to fruition in our world. And in our country, sexual self-expression without biblical categories, which I might add are reasonable and natural, is rampant in our world and in our country. Why is that? Because Satan loves and promotes lies. And perverse behavior in rebellion to God and His order and design of creation. Whatever glorifies God is always the opposite of Satan's activities. You can count on it. And the object of his scorn. Satan delights in destroying human beings by telling them lies and by getting them to believe something that the world is teaching. There's a reason why Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief, meaning Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Don't believe the lies of this culture. And parents, teach your children that from the earliest age. Not to believe the lies of this culture in this very, very charged environment, but also to remember that 
the balanced young man or young woman comes forward filled with the Spirit and self-control, but at the same time able to enjoy that which God has given to them in the confines of Christian marriage. So this passage shows us from an earthly perspective the beautiful tension between sexual expression and self-control. And one other thing that it teaches, I believe, is our constant need for sanctification and watchfulness. I think verse 15 says that. The Lord would say to us, catch the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. Don't wait. First Peter says, be of sober mind, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Marriage is hard. It takes work and a sober spirit. Otherwise, a couple would just go their own way. It's much easier to give up. It's much easier not to see the reality of the fact that we need each other. And God put us together for a reason. Marriage is hard and it takes much work and a sober-minded spirit. And marriage demands maintenance as Satan is always looking for that opportunity. If you're married, take my advice, and I want to take my own advice, to catch the little foxes and not let something small turn into something great and big. We all need sanctification. And Christ is in the process of shaping us. And often in marriage, He does that with the help of our spouse who is suited especially for us. Our constant need for sanctification and watchfulness. And that's really true of all of us, married or not. This passage is a beautiful picture of balance and symmetry and the beauty of God's creation and the beauty of the things that are available to us as a result of God's grace. But we need to be good stewards of them. We need to see ourselves as lilies of the field. We are temporary, but Christ is eternal. And our relationships in this life should be patterned by His great love for us and His church. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for love's already and love's not yet. We thank You for the presence of love, and we thank You for the future. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us in the present would have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And if not, Lord, that you would drive that person to their knees to see their need, to see their sin, and the fact that you alone can cleanse them of sin and give eternal life. And Father, for the rest of us, help us on the road of sanctification. Help us to take warnings. Help us to catch the little things that show up in our relationships, Lord, so that they may not become big things of division. Lord, give us grace to do all of this and work in our hearts that which is pleasing in your sight. And we'll give you the praise and glory for all that you do today. We make our prayer in Jesus' name.